Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are a fan of the true and spooky, scary stories, you came to the right place. If this is your first time here and you like what you are hearing, please take a moment and check the description below. And don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Backwoods Creepy Stories, a five-part series, right after this intro and ad will play, before I begin reading the series and ad will play. And in between each part, an ad will play. After that, there will be no more ads within the video. Wyoming's a strange place, vast and empty, yet filled with ruthless wildlife and nature. Even the most mundane can become the most terrifying when you're alone in the woods. Are you ready to get lost? This series is based on a true story. Only names have been changed for their protection. Part one, light in the sky. The year was 2020. I was jobless and without a care in the world. Unemployment checks were coming in and for the first time in my young life, I had enough money to put down on a brand new shiny car. I went to the dealership and, pretty much, chose the first car I saw, a 2008 RAV4. Mind you, I know it's not a brand new car, but to me it was a car made of solid gold. I never owned anything with less than 200,000 miles at that point. It was freeing to buy a brand new car with no problems. I'd gotten a clean bill of health for my mechanic and figured there was no other way to break it in than to go on a road trip. My old friend had been car camping across the U.S. at that point, and we made a plan to meet in Wyoming for my first real outdoor excursion. I packed a sleeping bag, a tent, and any other gear I could fit and drove my way out to the Medicine Bow National Forest to meet my friend. The drive there was an experience in itself. No cell service, empty roads, only us and the dry, dense trees. It was nearing the middle of June as we drove our rigs out into the middle of the forest. Giant snowdrifts still lay on most of the dirt roads, making some entirely impassable. But the glacier lilies and grape hyacinths were slowly peeping their heads out, and the blades of fresh green grass crept through the patches of ice and snow. The forest was still reawakening from its chilly slumber, and it made the whole landscape that much more ethereal. The birds were singing, the bugs beginning to buzz after a long winter. We drove through the trees, north as far as we could passing through large swaths of burn scar that became more and more apparent as we passed on. The landscape was beautiful, and there was something unnerving about those dead trees and the way they creaked in total silence. Light started to fade and we landed in a camp spot that was partially burned, most likely from a fire decades before. The singed trees gave way to breathtaking views of the Alpine Mesa. We lit a small fire and set up camp as we caught up with each other's lives. It was pitch black, and as we sat over the campfire, roasting broads and laughing over old memories, when I saw it, it started as a sliver of light on the horizon, thin but bright. It looked like a car that had its brights on, far, far away. But the thing was, we were on one of the last accessible roads. There were no other roads that direction, only dead, fallen trees for miles. But the light got brighter. What is that? I finally exclaimed. 
My friend looked over his shoulder and was just as bewildered as I was. It was so bright, and it appeared to be coming closer and brighter. Suddenly, the thought of a forest fire flashed through my mind. I'm sure the same idea went through my friend's head as we locked eyes shot up from our seats. The light was captivating, hypnotizing almost. But time was short. We secured around the camp in a frenzy, trying to track down our things. The light became larger and brighter. I had never seen anything so bright in pure darkness before. As it grew in size, so did my fear. Was it another camper driving aimlessly through the forest? A fire? A bomb? The end of the world? In a strange moment, we both stopped and looked towards the light. The silver had turned into a blinding cascade of light, and it continued to grow. The trees around us lit up, and their strange, scraggly shadows were cast down upon the ground. We looked onward, bathed in the light of this great, bright thing. What was it? With the silence, up it crept. That was when we realized it was the moon. <laughs> A full moon, the fullest I've ever seen, I'd say. <laughs> We laughed hysterically as the moon rose, teasing ourselves for getting so paranoid. Spirits returned to normal as we settled in for a chilly night of sleep. To this day, I've never seen a full moon so big and so bright as the one that evening. And I think it's pretty silly for one person to mistake the moon for a forest fire. But for two people to do it, that's a little bizarre. Maybe it was a warning, a foreshadowing of strange things to come. At least maybe that's how I should have seen it at the time, of what lay ahead of me. Part 2. No Turning Back It was a chilly June morning. I awakened with a slight mist on my breath and wiggled out of my sleeping bag. We couldn't have gotten off to a better start. It was a beautiful early summer day. The sun was shining with only a few small puffy clouds speckled across the big bright blue sky. My friend, Sam is how we will now refer to him, and I packed our remaining gear and got back on the rough back roads of the Medicine Bow National Forest. Today, we are heading even more north to a large but secluded reservoir in the middle of the forest. We had lost most of our Google Map data as we gotten further in, and both of our cars were without GPS and touchscreen. But, as I'd learned from my former analog camping escapades, you just gotta look for the big brown signs and that'll usually lead you in the right direction. I didn't think twice about not having a physical map with us. Hindsight's 2020. It was strange having the roads all to ourselves. You would think the place would be infested with four-wheelers and happy campers, but the mix of the 2020 pandemic and an extra wet winter left scant others on the trail. The further we went, the less people we saw, until eventually, we hadn't come across another person in several hours. The roads had gotten progressively worse as we drove on large, muddy ruts turned into slushy potholes that would explode into a rainbow of ice shards with each tire rotation. I followed closely behind Sam's forerunner rolling along in my stock summer tires as best as I could in the ever-deepening snow. But there came a point in the road where even Sam second-guessed getting across. There were a few logs lodged into the drift to help with traction. Even so, it was still a good three feet of slushy wet snow. Sam approached cautiously, but with a few spin of the tires, he made it across the drift, 
Now it was my turn. Call it stupidity, inexperience, whatever you want. I was determined to make it over that damn pile of snow. I didn't want to come off as that fearful little girl that couldn't do tough outdoor shit. And so Sam was across. I put the pedal to the metal and gunned my little RAV4 across the snow. I heard my car revving and groaning as I pushed on, only to come to a sputtering stop in the middle of the snowdrift. Tired as I might, I couldn't roll forward. I couldn't go back. My car had sunken into the soft snow, and I was stuck in the equivalent of cold quicksand. Now, we weren't totally unprepared. Sam had a couple of toe straps. The challenge was finding a way to attach them onto my car and drag it out. My hands were frozen and scratched from the ice as we dug with any shovel-type instruments we could find. It took some time, but inch by inch, we wriggled my car free. Not without damage, though. We had ripped off my undercarriage cover in the process, and who knew what else that couldn't be seen with the naked eye. I was pissed, mostly at myself for being such an idiot. Not only had I damaged my brand new car, but the road was now totally inaccessible after our laborious snow digging operation. The piles of slush and mud made it impossible for either of us to turn back the way we came. Thankfully, we were pressing on north using a different route, but with each mile we drove, I felt less and less confident. If there was this big old snow pile on one of the main back roads, who's to say how the other roads will look further on? We arrived at the reservoir by mid-afternoon, hungry and irritable. Our thoughts soon melted away with the summer sun and waterside views. The reservoir wasn't officially open for the season due to COVID, so we were met with empty benches and the soft sounds of the waves on the shore. It was very peaceful and very much needed after spending the last few hours digging my car out of the cold snow. Little did we know, there were clouds on the horizon. Dark ones. The white puffballs of the morning had turned in ominous black and a chill wind had swiftly picked up. Something was coming. Part 3. The Storm We sat on the beach for what seemed like ages, simply absorbing the last 24 hours. It's crazy how time can stretch when you're out in the wild. The trek out the night before, the car getting stuck, things that would feel so mundane or mildly inconvenient in day-to-day -day life felt like a momentous event out here in the middle of nowhere. The calm waves became louder, more rushed as they lapped against the eroded rocks of the shore on which we sat. The summer sun slid behind the clouds, and the balmy 70-degree day dropped to a quick 30 degrees within the span of us walking from the beach back to our cars. Like a whisper, a single snowflake fell on my windshield as I shut my driver door, and I knew we were in for a storm. As a Colorado child, I was raised to laugh in the face of snow, especially in June. But our measly storms were no match to those of Wyoming. The few flakes fattened and fell in large clumps as we traversed our way into the trees. Our route out was to take less than an hour and got us just outside the small town and Centennial. Maybe, if we went quickly, we would outrun the storm. Maybe, just maybe, if we were lucky, we would find a little hotel for the night and wait out the cold weather. Optimism is futile in the wild, 
Practicalism is a much better option. We drove on and the snow got worse. I squinted and white knuckled my wheel while I navigated the rutted road that was coated in fresh powder. Sam was only a few feet ahead of me, but I was having trouble keeping track of him. When heavy snow falls that fast, it's like trying to stare through the static on a television. It had been just over an hour when Sam came to a sudden stop. It took me a second to see why, but smack dab in front of us was a snowdrift on the road that was at least 10 feet tall. Our way out was impassable. It snowed harder. Sam ran out from his car to my window. We had to make a plan, and fast. We had no GPS, no maps, no cell phone service, and zero way out in the middle of a summer blizzard, by which we were completely unprepared for. Our best bet was to head back towards the reservoir, and even now that was an hour away, and all of the already foreign roads were now covered in a blanket of snow. We did our best to retrace our tracks, but we're losing daylight fast. We go down a road, certain it was the way back, only to be met with a dead end or a snowdrift. Over and over, we try a road, dead end, and turn back around, bringing my gas tank down to less than half full. Finally, with a stroke of luck, we found a familiar looking clearing with a road that we were pretty sure would take us back to the reservoir. It was almost dark and the snow was now impossible to drive in with my summer tires. So knowing we were possibly on the right track, we finally pulled off to make camp. As I put my car in park, I looked out the window onto a group of nearby moose stampeding through the clearing. The snow swirled around their black silhouettes as they pounded toward the forest. The silence after was deafening. We were all alone out here. As you would imagine, we weren't expecting a winter storm in the middle of June, and I wasn't prepared for it either. Back then, I was still relying on a Walmart camping setup, and that was maybe good for sleeping in 40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The heaviest jackets I had were a sweatshirt and a raincoat. No gloves. My cheap butane stove barely lit in the cold temps, and food supplies were dwindling fast. I couldn't keep my car running for heat because we had no extra gas and no idea how long it would take to find a new route out to asphalt. The cold set in, then reality. I felt broken as I started to shiver. The epic camping trip was turning out to be a lot more epic than expected, and I was starting to get scared, to be honest. Sam was far better than I, but still had a tinge of anxiety in his manner. Our way out was blocked. The way we came in was blocked, even more so with the fresh snow. There were plenty of roads around us, but we were effectively stuck in a labyrinth without a map. There was no way to tell which of the roads would be blocked by mounds of snow and which would lead us out, if we could even get out. We were lost in Wyoming. It was now pitch black outside. The wind picked up and screamed as I huddled in the back of my car, trying to build a makeshift tent out of any extra blankets to stay warm. The snow was stacking up. I did not have a good feeling about this. I think the area ended up getting about a foot of snow from start to finish. For the Google Map enthusiasts, I can't guarantee this is the exact route or spot as it's been a few years. As for the way back to the reservoir, I really can't say. I was so focused on not getting stuck that I left a lot of navigation to Sam. We definitely did not go back the way we came and got lost on a few dead-end roads 
forcing us to turn around a few times. All forest roads start looking the same after a while. It is a huge problem. I know we eventually landed where we were now because I remember the clearing so distinctively after a lifetime of trees. Part 4. Snow Day in the Summer I awoke with a thud. I didn't remember falling asleep. The constant howls of the wind had played through my ears the entire night. Boom. Another one. I realized it was snow falling on the roof of my car. I suddenly remembered where I was and sat up. Dawn had broken and the sun was peeping through in glints and glimpses through the low-lying clouds and fog. A few wisps of snow fluttered through the air, but for the most part of the storm, it had passed. It seemed like it'd be a gray day, and it was time to assess the damage and pee. It had been a while. I didn't even remember drinking any water the day before. I tore away my insulating blankets and cracked open the car door. It looked like a winter wonderland outside. The thin, dry pines were now gritty with snow. The roads were no longer covered in snow, but were left with a slushy, wet crust that crunched as you walked. It was cold, and the clumps of snow in the trees started falling faster in rhythmic thumps to the ground. Sam's car door creaked open, and he peeked out, looking just as bewildered as I felt. As mentioned in Part 3, we weren't exactly prepared for a winter storm in the middle of June. We had no map, no GPS, and no cell service. My car had summer tires, and who knows what kind of damage after getting stuck and lugged out of the snowdrift just a few days prior. My gas tank was less than half full after trying to backtrack to the reservoir. There was no way I could drive until the roads dried, and we found a solid way out. We could use Sam's forerunner to drive around and search, but he had less gas than I had. We relied too heavily on stocking up in the next town, all of our supplies, including food, which was very low. We couldn't even make a fire because everything was soaked with wet snow. We made a decision right then and there that we weren't going anywhere in the cars that day. Today would be a snow day. In times of unexpected crisis, there is some solace in trying to find humor in the situation. I didn't want to focus on the fact that we were stuck or lost or almost out of food. At first, we stuck to our campsite. We had landed in quite a beautiful spot. It was the start of a small clearing with a rocky creek running nearby. The moose from the night before would occasionally walk out on the far opposite end of the clearing, and we watched on as they scavenged for food under the fresh snow. The fog began to clear out, then we slowly ventured further from the cars only to realize the creek got larger and wider, and eventually it fed into the reservoir. I was only about a mile away. We were much closer than we had thought. Our best idea of the whole trip, in my opinion, was to walk to the parking area of the reservoir and see if there was a map. It was maybe two miles, but now that we had our bearings, we were ready to skip in leaps and bounds to the reservoir. It was as if nature sensed the positive vibes and the sun came out to shine on our way towards the shore. Just as we had hoped, a map came in sight as we walked down the road to the picnic tables and bathrooms. It seemed like the road went in a giant loop around the reservoir and we followed that loop. The road would connect back to Fox Park, where we started. There were really only three ways in and out of this area. 
and this was our last option, with the other two roads being blocked. If we wanted to get close to getting out, or to help at least, this was the way to try. With that, we meandered along the creek back towards the cars with high hopes. As we got closer though, I noticed a small white cross nailed to a tree atop a small rock outcropping. We walked towards it, minding each icy rock as we went. It appeared to be some sort of memorial or grave for something or someone. Years of sun and ice had bleached most of the writing away. Once we realized what it was, we both fell silent and swiftly stepped off the large, rocky mound. Slightly unnerved, we beelined it towards the campsite, and that was only a few hundred feet away. Some of the wood had dried out enough for a small fire, and we sat closely huddled. I made my last packet of ramen. After this, all I had was a protein bar, an onion, and some instant coffee. I really didn't want to eat that onion. The sun set, and with the warm spirits of the day, a cold uncertainty returned. We went to bed early, but woke up in the dark at around 3 a.m. I heard a loud noise outside and set straight up. The silhouette of a single moose stood outside my car no more than five feet away, completely still. His antlers looked like large hands splayed upward towards the starry sky. The silhouette of his massive body was like some sort of contorted human standing there, watching. He looked like a statue, motionless in the dark. I lay back down silently, hoping this to be a good omen albeit a frightening one. Tomorrow would tell. Part 5. The Way Out Today would be the day we would get out of this mud-forsaken labyrinth. I could just feel it. My eyes fluttered open to the ceiling of my car, frost and condensation stuck to the windows. Not as cold as yesterday, not warm either. The sun gleamed down on the remaining snow outside. There was a good amount of melt overnight. The roads weren't dry, but they were a lot better than yesterday. It was decided we would both go, leaving our small camping hovel behind. It was much better to get closer to civilization than it was to stay here. If we couldn't get out, then others couldn't get in. We warmed our cars and our bodies with the remaining instant coffee and hopped on the road. There was no sense in wasting time. We followed the road towards the reservoir, and I couldn't help but feel a little sad to leave our snow globe of solitude. I don't know if it was the isolation or the sheer intensity of everything that had happened and could potentially happen in the next few hours. But part of me just wanted to stay in that spot forever. It was peaceful, unnervingly peaceful. Just as we passed the bullet-ridden stop sign to the reservoir, I saw two moose far across the clearing, standing there motionless staring in our direction. I felt like they didn't want us to leave, like we were some new entertainment for them after the long months of winter. The reservoir came into our sights and we headed straight, heading past the parking lot in mere minutes compared to our 45-minute walk there the day before. It had seemed like such a journey of survival only 24 hours ago, wondering if we would find a map, a way out. Now it was just another blip on the screen of memories. The road began to branch off like a tree, endless openings to unnamed roads, leading to who knows where. Everything was hidden by the trees. We did our best to follow the small brown number signs and veered left along the reservoir edge. I was hopeful 
elated even, when I saw us winding our way closer and closer to the dam far off on the other side. I could almost taste a fresh gas station breakfast burrito. Just as we were approaching the final set of curves, the unthinkable came into sight. We had dealt with mud, snow, but the last thing we planned was for trees, and right in the middle of our route was a large group of dead, fallen pines. We had a saw and an axe, but it would have taken literal days for the two of us to hack and lever those trees off the road. Trust me when I say we seriously considered spending the rest of the day hacking through those trees, but it wouldn't be futile. Our final way out was blocked. We had no choice but to turn back. To say I was upset was an understatement. I was cold, tired, hungry, and very low on gas. But with each passing mile, the thoughts of abandoning the cars to walk to hell became more of a reality. From the map at the reservoir, it had only shown three routes in and out of this area, and we had now found all three to be blocked. We hadn't seen signs of another human in days. We weren't left with many other options, but once again, we had to make a new plan. It was now turning truly into survival, and we went on in both cars. We both risked emptying our gas tanks and ended up further into the forest if we ventured on. If we left one car, we could use the other to explore some of the infinity amounts of back roads that surrounded us. But, as was the challenge in the days before, we didn't know which would be blocked, or if any would lead us out. We finally decided that our best bet was to go back to the reservoir, back to the initial way we came in, and spend the rest of the day shoveling away as much snow and ice as we could to get through. It was not a promising plan, but was better than trying to saw through hundreds of pounds of logs or wasting more gas than getting more lost. The drive back around the water's edge was not a pleasant one. The positive nostalgic vibes I had woken up had evaporated. It was a hard lesson learned to not get too set on one plan in a survival situation, because more often than not, the plan will not go according to plan at all. We approached a crossroad that would take us back the way we came and I rode down my windows to bring in some fresh air and clear my mind. And then I heard something, very faint, over the rumbling of our motors. Zoom. A flash of red sped past us. Zoom, zoom. Two more. It was a gaggle of ATVs driven by some old men in ratty old sweatshirts, ripped jeans, and trucker hats, going in the opposite direction of the reservoir. Our eyes widened, and before I could think to say anything, Sam's forerunner kicked mud into my windshield and started going left. I followed. We didn't see the ATVs anymore, but the road was wet enough that we could still follow their tracks. They continued straight for a while and eventually came to a large fork and veered left deeper into the trees. It was only now that I thought about the possibility of them going for a joyride, and we were throwing ourselves deeper into the forest. But if they had experienced anything like us, 90% of the roads out here were impassable, and if they had to turn around, it seemed like there was no better help to get out than some backwoods Wyoming folk. We drove on, and the snow drifts around us dissipated. The mud-slushing road was now mostly dry, save for a few water-filled potholes. Bugs started buzzing. The color of the fresh flowers I had seen driving in those days before reappeared on the sides of the road. And finally, a cabin. 
I wanted to scream with joy. Just as we passed a few more cabins, my phone buzzed. For the first time in days, I had service. Sam and I stopped for a brief moment to indulge in our phones. There were a few texts for my mom, but I had told her to expect to not hear from me for a few days, as service in Wyoming can be hit or miss. Little did she know. A few Snapchat notifications were listed on my screen too, but for the most part, everything seemed entirely normal, and it was just another unremarkable June day. Finding sales service didn't solve all of our problems though. We were both at least less than a quarter of a tank by now, and doubted we could get to Fox Park and Centennial with what was left. Cautiously, we decided to drive on the back roads to the small town of Albany and on to the closest gas station in Centennial. It cut our miles in half. We made sure to take plenty of screenshots of the route map, something we have chuckled that we should have done days before. The roads were now bone dry as we drove on. The temperature rose significantly, and for the first time in days, I was hot. My windows were rolled down and I invited in the warmth and sound of the cheerful summer birds. The road descended slowly into a large valley that could be caught in glimpses through the thinning trees, and eventually a small town came into view. Albany. We slowed to a rolling stop as we saw sleepy locals ending their days in the surrounding houses. Neighbors were chatting on the sidewalks with their dogs, happily distracted by the bountiful wildlife that had re-emerged after the cold storm. I laughed as the dusty asphalt of a real road came into view. It was the first I had seen in days. My shoulders relaxed as we drove on and picked up speed, flying towards the gas station as fast as we could. It felt good to know where we were. We were no longer lost in Wyoming. We were on the road again to new destinations and new adventures. The only remaining evidence of our passings there were the settling dust on the old rutted back roads of the Medicine Bow. The End Epilogue Though it was years ago, this trip often sits in the back of my head when I am in a time of struggle. I had camped before, but I had never gone so far off the beaten path as I had in Wyoming. It was so scary, intimidating, and I had to learn how to not cry or work through the tears and figure out how to fix the situation I was in instead of giving up. It's a little funny to think back on how much of a survival situation it felt like, because at this point in my life, I've spent many more days much further out in the woods. But for some reason, even recounting my story now gave me the chills and made me feel the same emotions I felt when I was going through it, almost like it was just yesterday. It was a blast writing this series. I wanted to serve as a warning to anyone that plans to trek out into the forest. Be prepared. Do your research. Download maps. Get physical maps. Pack extra food and warm layers. This story could have turned out a lot worse. I could have written it so. I wanted to show that even the most basic mistakes can cause the most epic consequences. But with some common sense and perseverance, you can avoid a much bigger disaster. I didn't really bring it up in the story, but I really do owe my life to my friend Sam. If I had been out there alone, or with anyone else really, I'm sure I would have been 100% screwed. We lost touch over the years. He went on to be some sort of a car-dwelling adventurer. I'm not really sure what he's up to now. So Sam, if you're out there reading this, thank you for the memories. It all started with an urge to break my new car in, 
and I certainly did that. Unfortunately, this would be one of only two road trips in the RAV4. Three months after this trip, I was in a head-on collision that totaled my car, and my gypsy wagon was no more. That's a story for another time, though. Thank you so much for listening to my series. Maybe one day I'll write about some of my other strange outdoor adventures. But until then, don't get lost. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true backwoods creepy stories. A five-part series. I do apologize about the short length of the video, but I only wanted to put these five parts in a video by themselves. I'd like to take a moment to give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Tina Mead, Colt Stone Wolf, Luz Crispin, CAG, Denise Sess, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norman DW, Chrissy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty Sneets. I truly thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Thank you all for being such huge supporters of Back to Ashes. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this series. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.